boss, and besides this, and besides this, my average camp is okay. It's a pressure on campus, frankly speaking. So, Queen's Hall will rule everywhere. And at the end, the trophy is coming back to this hall. And again, they are coming up against Mensa Sapao from the University of Ghana. We are the very champions of debate. Legal matters, no hall can be compared to Sabah Hall. And we have a whole lot of such astute intellectuals who come in into this competition are going to definitely express the very depth of brilliance. Mesa Sabah Hall champions most of all competitions. We double in everything. We have prowess in entertainment, we have prowess in sports. The talents that have been nurtured over the years. Sabah intellectuals. We are championing it. We are aiming to win this competition. We're not coming to bite. We are coming to win. We have Poco, we have JC, we have all the fraternities. So we are the Vikings. Sabah is coming for the competition and we are coming with more fire. Ask Poco Mates to stay. Poco Mates! Fire! Unity! Solidarity! Unity! Solidarity! Hey! 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 hey. For the motion, Payment and walkways have become mini markets for vendors. Driving them away without creating a market space for them is an exercise in futility. And that is the motion. That's another interesting motion. And of course, Queen Elizabeth, the second hall, will be speaking for the motion. And Mesa Sabah Hall will be speaking against the motion. Okay, so before the debate commences, we would like to acknowledge our moderators in the auditorium Professor Gorski Alabi. We expect a very exciting uh, competition. We, I in particular anticipate that it is very likely that the traditional halls like the Commonwealth Hall, the Katangas, the Marinas, the Caspodians are going to come in very strongly with their support base with their kind of culture and traditions to intimidate the, the young um, homes. But I expect that the young homes are going to put up a very, very strong competition. They must hold themselves together. They must surprise us because they should come in their numbers to surprise the traditional homes. We believe this is going to be a very, very exciting um, reality show that will generate a lot of interest. In terms of leadership, we'll be looking out of coordination and synergy and the teamwork, the flow between them, the ability to identify each other's strengths and make very good use of those strengths. This is a very good venture and it is going to unearth so many qualities of the students we have at the university level. These topics given are not given anyhow. They were carefully carved out, carefully selected, carefully really monitored and uh, carefully considered in terms of how beneficial it would be to the nation. And we know that at the end, something good will come to help the development of the nation. Expression of thoughts, use of language, and uh, how to bring peace. Because no nation without peace can ever develop. Okay, and this show is brought to you by YAT producers of Put Conflict and Put Frosted Conflict. They, they are also supported by Capital O2. Now, a little advice to our debaters. When the bell is round one, it means you have done a minute of your assertion. When it is round twice, it means you have two minutes more to finish with your presentation. And when the bell is run continuously, it means that the time for your presentation is up. Let us kindly desist from 
Stephen Moore presentations after the bell is rung. So on this note, we thank very much Queen Elizabeth II Hall and Mensa Sabah. Shall we give them a round of applause? And again, we just have to move So thank you for the motion. We welcome Queen Elizabeth II Hall. Ladies and gentlemen, pavements and walkways have become mini markets for most vendors. Driving them away without provision for a better market space is an exercise in futility. My name is Esina Michao Saibunsu, speaking for the motion, right? So what we do first is I give a bit of contextualization on what the debate is going to be about. We analyze the nature of street vending, then we prove to you why driving street vendors off the streets without providing them a better market space is an exercise in futility by the government, right? So an exercise in futility in today's debate is simply means something that is incapable of producing any useful results. In other words, something that is pointless or useless, right? So this debate is not about whether street vendors are a menace to society and whether governments should drive them off the streets. I think from the motion, it's pretty implied that this is about the way forward. Do we drive them off the streets by providing them a better market space or we just drive them off the streets without any provision for any better market space, right? So those are the comparisons on which the debate will run today, right? And I think the underlying assumption in the debate is that this happens in a space where no alternatives exist. So it means governments drive people off the street without providing them a better market space as an alternative for their economic sustenance. And then even if these alternatives exist, it means these alternatives are not better for the current situation these people find themselves in, right? So now let's look at the nature of street vending. Street vending Street vending is an ancient and important occupation virtually found in every country and major city, right? They are associated with issues like congestion, health and safety risks, tax evasion, and the sale of shoddy merchandise, right? Ghana especially has a long history of legislations, both local and municipal regulations that are targeted at getting rid of street vendors. Example is the AMA bylaw in 1995 that strictly said street vending is unlawful and is strictly prohibited by the laws of the country. And then in 2005, there was a decongestion exercise. And over the years, there have been several special tax force that have been set up to get rid of these street vendors. Now, the most important question in this debate is why is that after all these years of these legislations, over decades, about five decades since the existence of these countries, street vending is still a menace in this country, right? And even after street vendors themselves especially know that their job poses a, a very great hazard to them because then they are more likely to be the victims of road traffic accidents. Despite all these occupational hazards, the most important question, why is it that this exercise by government has proved futile all these years? We tell you it's because government tries to get these people off the streets without providing them an alternative market space for them to survive, right? So first argument as to why this is an exercise in futility, right? Now the first thing we tell you is, Governments can never implement a policy without first fulfilling its mandate to their people, right? A core mandate of every government is to promote the welfare of its citizens. This cuts across all sectors like health, education, and economics. And especially in a welfare state like Ghana, governments are largely responsible for these um, uh, improving the welfare of their citizens, right? Now, in instances where government does not fulfill its core mandate of improving the lives of its citizens, it becomes very difficult when government wants to implement certain policies that go against the fundamental sustenance of these individuals. For example, in a country where government has systematically failed to provide educational institutions and private institutions are set up to cater for the educational needs of the country, you realize that government in such a country can never impose any law or policy saying that they are closing down these private schools because then the alternatives do not exist for these people. So if government is to essentially close down these schools in such a setting, it means that people would have no alternative for being educated. Now let us relate it to this, this debate, right? Economic prosperity of citizens is a core mandate of government. Government is supposed to make policies that make it easier for businesses to thrive and government is supposed to, as much as possible, provide infrastructure for small-scale businesses to also thrive. Now, in the instance where especially these street vendors are 
I have been identified as a problem in these countries and government wants to get them off the streets. What's the best way of getting them off the streets? First, ensure that you are providing them with a better market space as an alternative, which is first and foremost the core mandate of these people. If government has not fulfilled this mandate, human beings will always find a way of sustaining themselves. And however they choose to do it, governments usually government cannot enforce any laws that says they shouldn't do it that way. So governments can never, or the exercise of driving away street vendors will always prove futile in this country because government is not fulfilling its mandate by providing them the necessary infrastructure, right? Now the second thing we argue is the lack of political will in this country, especially, right? Because usually governments want to pander to party politics and no government wants to be the bad guy who sacks people off the street because then they want to get re-elected. So an example is the issue of Galamse, right? Over the years, consistently, every government identifies that Galamse is an issue and they should get rid of it. But then the lack of political will to be able to see it through and drive these uh, Galamse operators is usually not there because they are scared of the backlash that will exist if government is seen to implement such a cruel policy of sacking its own people from something that sustains their livelihood. So what is the antidote to this lack of political will? We tell you the antidote is providing them better alternatives because then if government is saying that I'm taking the street vendors off the street, it's not a cruel policy because then I'm giving them a better alternative, then government has all the justification and the high ground to go through with this, right? So we realize that in the current government with the issue of Galamse, there's been a large collaboration from all sectors, both part, uh, bipartisan and uh, in getting rid of Galamse because the difference with this government's implementation is that they are providing these Galamse operators another alternative. They are telling them that form an alliance of small scale miners and then let us get you a uh, license and operate within the scope of government, right? So government then has the high ground and the political will to be able to push through getting rid of menaces in society like street vendors. So the same thing applies to street vending. If you really want to get rid of them and you don't want that exercise to be a futile exercise, give them a better alternative and gather as much momentum and support and political role as possible to be able to follow through with that exercise, right? Third argument is about choice architecture and how if government does not influ um, influence people's decisions, it becomes very difficult for them to want to uh, get things done like this, right? So. The whole idea of choice architecture is that individuals are rational and when provided with multiple options, individuals will always make the best decisions for themselves based on the facts and logic, right? Now, how does this apply to today's debate? That means that on the average, looking at how tedious street vending is and looking at the occupational hazards that come with it, how these people are at a much higher risk of being knocked down by Okada vehicles, cars, reckless drivers and what have you. It means that these individuals might prefer a better alternative to their current situation because their current situation is not the best. But then, because of economic sustenance and the fact that these people have to survive and they do not have any other option, they will want to remain on the street. So now, if government wants to implement a policy that says get these people off the street, government should be able to attract these people with a more viable alternative that makes them more willing to even go there without the use of force. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. have become mini markets for most vendors. Driving them away without provision for a better market space is an exercise in futility. My team and I from the Mesa Sabah Hall are clearly against this motion in particular, right? But before we even delve into the motion to understand what it means and the arguments that we bring to our people, we'll take the wording of the motion and why I said they misconstrued it in the debate. But let's take them at their rebuttals and the arguments that they bring into the context. First of all, they tell us that this has uh, um, prevailed because government did not provide markets in the first place. Ladies and gentlemen, this is insulting to the intelligence of every Ghanaian within this room, ladies and gentlemen, because we all know that within this country, within almost every district, there is a market, ladies and gentlemen. There is a place which is legally ordained to be a trading place for such activities, right, ladies and gentlemen. So the fact that such individuals have ignored such an activity shows an illegality in itself. I will engage further. But that also, they tell us that government has a duty to provide for the welfare of citizens. This is very confusing, ladies and gentlemen, because they tell us two things. 
Tell us that first they admit the dangers on these streets, that there's possibility of these people having accidents and stairs, terror. But because these people are going to make um, lots of fans, and because this thing has been in Ghana's history since ancient Ghanaian times, let's let them be there. So, in other words, ladies and gentlemen, these people are prioritizing the economy over the lives of these people on the streets. Something which any good um, saying government should not do in the first place, and for that, they are out of this place. Lack of necessary infrastructure. In the world, as I explained to you, why we did every district in Ghana here without reference to any document whatsoever? Because this is a fact, even a common child in Ghana knows, ladies and gentlemen. It is important that if there is such a place dedicated for trade, then these individuals get there. And lack of it, they have intentionally neglected it. This is not a matter of choice because. And even if it is a matter of trade, and gentlemen, we thought that these markets are within the confines of such areas. The individuals chose, and this is the very um, important reason, they chose based on their own reasons to stand out of such uh, matters as such a different thing. Go on to, to the wedding of talking about. In the most ladies and gentlemen, there are key words that we need to um, understand before we get to the elements of this, right? So we said driving them away, it connotes two things. One, that the action is sucking or sucking them is being undertaken by government. That these ma mini markets on pavement or walkways are illegal and unprescribed by the state, and that's why it will require the action.